Hello, everyone. So welcome to our virtual event space. Um, my name is Ali. You might recognize me from our Lake Forest Park location, and I am your host for this evening. Uh, I am so excited to be introducing Elisa Gabbard and Aria Aber here to discuss Elisa's new collection, Normal Distance. Um, but before we get into the good stuff, on behalf of all of us here at Third Place Books, I just want to quickly thank you all so much for tuning in. For those of you who may not know, we are an independent bookstore with three locations in the Seattle area. Uh, we're having more and more of our events in person, which is very exciting. But our online event program is sticking around to connect readers and authors in a virtual space. So thank you all so much for tuning in and of course for buying books. Your support is what makes all of this possible. Uh, so if you haven't gotten your hands on any of the books that come up this evening uh, and you would like to, I will be linking books in chat. For those of you in the Seattle area, come on in, um, grab a copy off the shelf, or you can place an order online and come pick them up in store. Or if you're not local or not leaving your house, we of course do ship. So go ahead and follow those links in chat over to our website. While you're over on the website, I definitely encourage you to check out some of our other upcoming events. We have an exciting roster coming up in the fall. So if you'd like to stay in touch with our community, you can sign up for our newsletter. It's a weekly update about events and exciting releases, um, our online book clubs, and of course you can follow us on any of the major social media platforms. We are at Third Place Books for the quickest updates and recommendations. So tonight we are here for about an hour and towards the end we will be taking questions. So if you have any questions, which we always hope that you do, uh, go ahead and leave those in the Q&A box, which should be either at the top or bottom of your screen. It's different than the chat box, which is great for virtual applause and connecting with each other. I see Matilda has discovered it. Hello. Um, I absolutely invite you to share where you're tuning in from in chat, but when it comes time for questions, do make sure those go in the Q&A so we can most easily find them. Um, while you're in our chat and question spaces, I want to remind you to please lead with kindness and refrain from any inappropriate behavior or harassment. And finally, should any technical issues arise, which can happen in the world of Zoom, uh, we will work as quickly as we can to resolve them, and we appreciate your patience and understanding. Um, all right, so uh, now is the time for us all to settle in, because without Further ado, I am so pleased to welcome Lisa Gabbert, author of six collections of poetry, essays, and criticism, including The Unreality of Memory and other essays, The Word Pretty, and of course, the book of the evening, Normal Distance. She writes a regular poetry column for the New York Times, which I love, and her work has appeared in Harper's Magazine, New York Times Review of Books, A Public Space, and elsewhere. Her next collection of essays, Any Person, is the only self comes out next year. In conversation this evening, I'm so excited to welcome uh, Aria Avery here, uh, author of Hard Damage, which won the Prairie Schooner Book Prize in Poetry. Her poems have appeared or will appear all over the place, including The New Yorker, The Yale Review, and Poem A Day. She's the recipient of a 2020 Whiting Award in Poetry and is currently a Wallace Stegner Fellow in Poetry at Stanford University. The book this evening is Normal Distance, uh, a, a literary hub, most anticipated book of the year. Uh, these poems collect strange facts, interrogate language, and ask unanswerable questions. They're sometimes funny, kind of sometimes kind of chilling. Um, Booklist called this a perfect post-pandemic collection. Um, I tore through most of it in a single like sitting or standing, I guess. I was behind the register at work, just like frantically hoping no one would join us. So I literally could not put it down. Um, so I'm going to go ahead now and get out of the way. Um, so thank you all so much for being here. Audience members, please do not be shy in chat or if you need anything. And with that, I'm going to pass the stage to our authors. So welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Allie. 
Thank you, Ali, for the introduction. <laughs> um, and thank you, Elisa, for having me to do this beautiful conversation with you. I'm very excited to hear you talk about your poems and to hear you read your poems. Um, I loved Normal Distance. Um, I just think it's such a beautiful and funny and, and sad and moving book. It feels like an existentialist account of like a woman's mind at work. And even though you are concerned with like the minutiae of our daily life. You somehow managed to derive from every tiny observation a really profound question, um, often ontological or epistemological, like what can we know and how do we know it? Or other questions like whether or not Wittgenstein is sexy. Um, <laughs> I, I feel like in these, like, the poems feel riffy and aphoristic, and um, I want to read something that by Bianca Stone, um, also a favorite poet of mine, said about uh, your work. Um, that you are unafraid to interrogate our maddening existence, vengefully honest and pierced with a blazing conversation toward philosophy. Always there is a solidarity in the poems. We're all together in this. We are the poet. Um, this description feels incredibly apt to me because even though the the details and the voice is so and the details in the poems and the voice of of your um your poetic voice is so idiosyncratic um the questions and concerns feel so elemental that they become universal um and i could relate to almost everything in this book and i think like a post-pandemic book um is also a great description um and it was very uh beautiful to reread this in my little um cavernous um <laughs> hotel room in Arizona where it's cold and dark and I feel kind of lonely um and yeah I just I'm excited to hear you talk about it maybe you can start by reading a couple of poems I will yes oh my god I'm I'm so happy we were able to make this work I really wanted to work we had some scheduling snafus I feel like it took forever to nail this event down but I'm so glad we did um and I feel like I'm cheating because I invited like a better poet than me. <laughs> all right, all right, you're such a good poet. And like, I don't know. I no, like not at all. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I, so I feel like a little bit like an imposter at this stage of my career. I know that sounds like insane, but <laughs> it's true. Like, I think. You know, when you're young, your your poetic voice, like I thought this is the way that I felt when I was young, it would just like was constantly geysering out of me. Like I could not stop it. I had to write multiple poems per week. Um, and like it was like workshops were great. I always had new poems to talk about. Like I couldn't stop writing. And the older I've gotten, the harder it is to write poems. And I have to like con myself into writing poems by like inventing some kind of new form that I can cram my thoughts into. And I totally did that with this book because like I still have the poetic impulse, but I'm not like courted by the muse the way that I used to be. Um, so I don't know. I just, and I really love like when poets have long careers, if you kind of compare their, their young work to their old work, mm -hmm. it changes so much. Um, I mean, often in really beautiful and inspiring ways, but I just think there's something about like the voice of youth <laughs> that is like so inherently poetic. Yeah. And as you said, um, these are like kind of riffy and chatty. And I was like, I was trying to capture that, like um, the, the youthfulness of, of my actual youth. <laughs> like mm -hmm. when I started writing poetry as a teenager and in my twenties, um, and I wanted them to feel like sort of unfinished and unpolished in a way, which you'll all, you'll all see. I'm gonna, I'm gonna read a few just to start. Um, so I'm going to kind of, I'm gonna read four poems that sort of illustrate the like progression of how I wrote these. So one in, um, one in the forum that I, that I kind of started writing these in. And the way that I, I've talked about this a lot recently, so if you've read like any of my recent interviews or anything, you might have seen this, but I started writing these by like collaging my old tweets, which... No, I didn't see this anywhere. Okay. <laughs> so, I didn't do enough research. <laughs> yeah, no, that, no, that's good, that's good. Um, so I feel like, like Jory Graham would say that that's just an abdication of like the difficult work of soul making like <laughs> if you're depending on collage you're not you're not doing the hard work you're not like 
going into the veil. So totally, I was cheating at first because I wanted to write some poems and I like didn't know where to start. So again, the muse was eluding me, evading me. And so I would just try to find like an old line that I had written that I thought I could start a poem with. And so that's why I wrote the first poem that I wrote in this book, um, not the first poem in the collection, but chronologically the first poem, which is called That to Philosophize is to Learn to Die. Mm -hmm. There was a metal band that was just called Death. I used to think I wasn't afraid of death, but actually what I wasn't afraid of was being dead. You can't attend your own funeral, but you have to attend your own death. You are going to die of something. I hope I die of boredom in my sleep. Do you ever remember being so excited about the future you were afraid you might die before it happened? I mean, who cares? Of course, democracy is dead. Death wish, free will, cause and effect, happiness as misery. I wonder if the wealthy dinosaurs were the last to die. Hemingway titled a book, Death in the Afternoon, which is the best possible name for a cocktail, then invented a cocktail named after it. I am extremely jealous of this whole move. I don't actually want to die laughing. Only one image of Virginia Eliza Klimpo has been authenticated, a watercolor portrait painted several hours after her death. There was 100% a culture of dead bodies of cool. Is a beautiful woman still beautiful even if all men everywhere are dead? Vanity ends with death. Who wants to be present in the moment? I want to die when an asteroid hits my cryogenic chamber. Naps, but for death. You can't actually sleep when you're dead. The secret to immortality is boredom. If you're bored enough, you'll never die. Die with dignity, like Benjamin Guggenheim. Death by attrition, war of natural causes. Death has an anchoring as in dragging down effect. So don't die. Sex and death kind of rhyme. You can sleep in your deathbed. Salpho, to die is evil, the gods think so, else they would die. Cry now, die later, move to Europe, smoke and die cool. I want to die someday. I don't want to die laughing. So that is how the book started. <laughs> I, I found a bunch of my old tweets that had die, dead, death, dying <laughs> in them, and like got them all in a document and just started kind of pushing the lines around. Like, you know, I was using tiles to make a little tabletop, um, what's the word? When you put tiles into a pattern on a tabletop? A mosaic or something? Yes, a mosaic, yes. I was, I was doing something mosaic-like, right? I was trying to find like, well, these two lines kind of go together the way like lines in a poem would. Like if I was writing <laughs> right. lines, like that's kind of the progression that my mind would make. Um, but they were mostly these like existing thoughts that it already had that it just decided like, well, they all sound like lines. So somehow I can make a poem out of these. But again, it did feel like I'm, I'm cheating a little bit, right? And so I wrote a couple like that and I would, you know, sort of slightly edit the tweets or, you know, insert something if I needed to, but they were like mostly tweets. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but then once I'd kind of gotten to the rhythm, I was like, well, I like this form, right? So they're these kind of long prosy lines. They're sort of isolated thoughts, but they're connected. And there's this automatic anaphora because that's how I found them. I was like searching for a word or related words or a little string of words. So I was like, well, so now I know how to write this from scratch. I don't have to depend on the old tweets anymore. So I started writing some that didn't have any old existing lines, but they follow the same kind of format. So I'll read one of those. This is the title poem. It's called Wild Animals, Normal Distance. I love that poem. Me too, it's one of my favorites. <laughs> Watching silent films in a backyard at night, 
I'm distracted by a bat fluttering overhead, its flight path so erratic. A moth made bright in the projector light. The day before in the park, there were so many midges in the middle distance, we couldn't estimate their number. Thousands, hundreds of thousands, a raccoon in the vines on a telephone pole, baby bunny in the grass. However cute, I like to imagine it might be rabid. I think a little threat is necessary for happiness. I think sometimes we want to be threatened. Sometimes we want to be the threat. Sometimes when I'm standing what feels like a normal distance from a person, they keep seeming to edge away. I must keep edging closer too, or the effect would stop happening, but it continues. Like when you go into the ocean, you never come out where you went in. I'm trying to decide if Wittgenstein was sexy. It's not obvious. I think the answer is yes or unanswerable. I think delicate people are frightening but I also think fear is erotic. Wittgenstein believed his Tractatus was the last work of philosophy that would ever need to be written, that he had answered all the important questions. He quit philosophy for a while and became an architect. He built a house for his sister she wouldn't live in. Einstein believed that publishing his theory of relativity would end all thinking about time. Now scientists believe we have a mirror universe, a reflection of our universe where time flows backward from the future to the past. The arrow of time either points in one direction or in two directions, forward and back. Why not in all directions, like a minute hand, or in all directions, like everything? I want to experience my past again, but as I was then, Doing what I did then, nothing changed. In what sense then am I not living through it again and again? Isn't the past always happening? All right, so <laughs> now, um, now I'm gonna read um, like a, a third kind of poem in the book, which is these shorter 15 line poems. Um, they're all, five stanzas, three lines each. Um, and they're more like, like truly linear, lineated, in, instead of these kind of like more prosy, prosaic, essayistic poems that I've been reading. Um, and I wrote these all during the first summer of the pandemic. So it's the year 2020. And I was in this little pod with my husband, John Cutter, and a our best writer friend, Michael Joseph Walsh, we were living in Denver, Colorado, and we were getting together once a week. And we would try to read each other a little something that we'd written. And um, yeah, I, I, could, I needed something short to write so that I could actually write a poem every week. <laughs> Again, the muse, just gone, no, not my friend. Like really pragmatic, this <laughs> yeah. Yes, exactly. And so I had written one of these much shorter poems and I was like, oh, I, I think I can do this once a week. Like, 15 lines, come on. Yeah. <laughs> this Elisa. Um, and I, like, if I was stuck, I would like go for a walk and I would like look around. And so actually I'm, I'm gonna read one that I, I really remember like seeing this thing um, on a walk and it's kind of what triggered the poem. And that's, that's how it would usually go. Like I, I would have to search out the news by going on a walk and I would see something that would give me some thoughts to start with. So this is one of those poems. It's called The Vagueness of the Moment. I saw a dead bunny in the grass, all bloody and ravaged, first by a dog or a hawk and now covered in ants. I stopped to look at it, but did not photograph it. There's no time for mourning. The deaths fall into the void of unceremony and become one death. It's not some monolith they say about everything, but everything is a monolith, a wave that never collapses. I play an eight hour track of rain sounds on windows all day on a loop. The sky is too high and I want to feel crushed. 
The vagueness of the moment has a crispness and memory like mountains from a distance. All right, so now maybe we can stop and chat for a minute. <laughs> yeah. These are such beautiful poems and I, I'm so glad that you um, read Wild Animals, um, Normal Distance, which kind of, I guess, gives the collection its title and that you talked a little bit about form and conception because I was curious about that. Um, these are such different poems. A lot of them have really long essayistic lines, as you said. So I was interested in, in hearing you talk a little bit about your relationship to line break, because then in comparison, you have these um, lineated, more traditional poems, and you say they're all 15 lines. So it's kind of like the Elisa sonnet, <laughs> just like <laughs> yes. a line. And they're very, they're elliptical, but highly lyric and, and feel uh, more imagistic, actually, than the other ones that feel more cerebral, I find. And yeah, maybe you can talk a little bit about line break and, and form. Yeah, yeah, I think um, I've noticed that it's a it's a little bit of a trend. And I think I think this often happens, right? Like you just you get trapped in like the maelstrom of the zeitgeist without knowing <laughs> you're going to be part of the zeitgeist, but you can't escape it. Like I was writing these poems at the same time that a lot of other books that have been coming out in the past couple of years clearly were being written, but I've seen a lot of books come out that are using the similar kind of form, like these like prose lines with gaps. And I've heard people try to come up with different ways to describe it. Like I've been using singlet sometimes. Like a singlet. Mm. <laughs> um, I, I don't think there's like an established poetic term for that form. I don't think there is, but it's basically like a one line stanza. Um, but in post. I hear mono stitch or whatever sometimes in workshop, but I don't even know whether that's. I I hear that too, but that I mean, if that's what we're gonna call it, sure. But that that usually means a one line poem. Yeah. Oh, really? A, Interesting. Yeah, versus a one line, or it used to. Then I, I I've, then then people are misusing it in the workshops that I'm attending. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, I mean, when I learned that term, yeah, yeah. Poem, um, like you know, I like trust you. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean. I, I like that use of that term, actually. I wish it did mean that, and maybe we can change it, you know? Yes. I wish it was. <laughs> Create <laughs> a dictionary of poetic terms. <laughs> yeah, um, because, like, it, it sounds so perfectly descriptive because you're, like, stitching together these, you know, these monolines. Um, but I think, like, I, I can think of a few poets that have worked in that form that, you know, maybe I wasn't even thinking of when I started writing these, but now I feel like, oh, clearly I'm in conversation with those poets, um, like Adel Adnan. Um, but I think what it does formally that's interesting is it kind of puts like all the usual pressure of the line break on the stanza break. And so it's like, in a sense, there's no line breaks in the poem. <laughs> and in another sense, every line break is like an extra, extra line break, you know, it's like a super line break because you have to take that, you know, that full hard pause. There's no real enjambment in the poem. Um, and to me, like, you know, sometimes I think there is no such thing as a poem without enjambment. Like if there's no enjambment, it's prose. Um, but you can't really make these, these rules or these laws. But I'm, I'm really interested in what happens when you put that extra pressure, like mm -hmm. when you force that extra space and you kind of turn every line into a fragment that stands somewhat alone. And in these poems in particular, I think where I felt most like excited about the possibilities of that were in the poems like Wild Animals, Normal Distance, where I was no longer collaging. I was trying to do the difficult work of soul making. And I felt that I had achieved a form that really illustrates the way thinking happens. Like when you're sitting down to write and you have an idea and then you kind of sit back and pause and you're like, okay, now I have to push that somewhere else. Like what's next, what's next, what's next? And then you take a pause and then the next line comes and that is what's next. I feel like the reader can really follow along on that like step-by-step chess move kind of movement or thinking that occurs um, when you're writing. And I just, it feels very enacted to me. Yeah. I totally agree. I feel like in these, I thought it over and over again that you are enacting thinking in these poems, especially in the longer ones. And funnily enough, I also 
over the last two years have been writing poems with these types of lines with like sentences that end with a full stop and then it's like they stand on them by themselves and um they feel slightly more essayistic and there is a wordiness to the to the poems that allows for deeper thinking i think and maybe for stranger associative leaps and i loved what you just said about fragments because they sometimes do feel like fragments even if there is a coherence in the in the thought or in the line of thinking um so so also like lyric fragments or fragmentary essays, I think often um, they need they need the reader or they depend on the reader to make um, to connect the threads and to engage. So they kind of force the reader to engage with with a poem and with the thinking. Um, and that feels like a very activating force, I think, for for a piece of writing. So um, jumping off of that, I wonder if you ever think about audience when you're writing, like if you're aware of your audience or of your reader and if they're on your mind when you're composing a poem or revising it. Yeah, unfortunately, <laughs> I, like, yeah, I, I wish, I wish less so. I think, um, yeah, like deeper into my career, it's, it's harder to, it's harder to forget, um, to forget the audience. And I think to some extent, I, I like hide behind poetry a little bit because like nonfiction is nonfiction. It says that right in the genre name. Like you're you're telling everybody like this is the truth, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> and that's very exposed. Um, and you just, I feel like I have to be really sure that I can stand behind everything I write when I'm writing nonfiction. Um, oh, what's like your <laughs> sorry so sorry no go ahead <laughs> it's just I, I like hold myself to a higher standard um so and then when I'm writing poetry I kind of feel like I'm behind this like gauzy curtain mm -hmm. and partly that's that not as many people read poetry as as read prose um but also like I do think poetry is a very hazy genre in the sense that you know people might call it nonfiction, but it's, it's more like fiction or like I often say, I feel like it's most like theater. Like mm -hmm. it's very, um, like you're creating this kind of persona or mask to hide behind and then you can feed all of your real thoughts and memories into it. But once it goes into the machine of the persona, it comes out different and it's no longer yours. It's like this third party's <laughs> whole situation and that's very freeing. Wow, I, I love that description and that comparison to theater and like thinking of the lyric eye as a mask, which kind of, yeah, through which you play or I, I don't know, it's, it's or perform really, there is really a performative quality to the poem. And I also think it's closer to fiction than nonfiction, even though so much of poetry, the contract of poetry between reader and, and writer seems to be based on truth telling to some extent. I are in this confession sorry i don't know how to turn off the notification noise <laughs> my laptop this is so unprofessional um, but i feel like we are in this um post-confessional poetry hangover still right like from the 60s and and everybody just accepts um expects that your poetry is absolutely exactly what you think and what you stand behind and i think in your in one of your interviews um with mandana you said that um you're, uh, you can do, you can say things that you're not fully, um, that you don't fully believe in, in poetry. And that's so interesting to me because I, um, often in poetry workshops, I think I've been, um, met with a question or not necessarily about my own work, but about also other people's work, whether or not, um, the, the speaker believes what they're saying or what they're doing yeah. and that's yeah such a strange constraint to put it on is. yeah and so when I, I say like that's how I feel as a writer right like I, I think I think that I can say things I don't believe but I do worry about audience right I wonder if that is how readers come to a poem like you know now in 2022 and I wonder if you feel that same freedom when you're writing poetry or if you feel like oh I, I do have to kind of stand behind everything in this poem because it's it's going to be read as an assertion of my own belief that's a really good question I think I struggle with that too I, I generally struggle with really prescriptive 
um, writing advice. Like you can never know anything in a poem. Like you can never say, I know this because what, whatever, like you're, nobody can be certain or whatever. I think that those are good guidelines, but they're there to be broken. And sometimes it's not that serious. But at the same time, I also, I do feel the pressures of audience too. And that's why I asked the question because I think it's an impeding force when I sit down to write and then kind of sh shoes the moose away, you know? <laughs> it doesn't feel as accessible anymore to just be uninhibited. And I mean, I only published one book, you've published like hundreds, so it must be even more. <laughs> It must be even more difficult for you, but it felt easier before I actually knew that the relationship to the public is real between my poetry and the page. And um, I really liked what you said at the beginning that you feel like an imposter, not because I think that's true, but because it's so relatable that I think I also feel like an imposter and probably all artists do. I've, I've spoken to some poets in their 70s or 80s and they still are anxious about new books coming out and thinking or when, when they haven't written in a few months that the poem, that poetry is over and it will never happen again. And I just think, wow, you've written like 800 books already. Of course, it's <laughs> come back, you know, but I think that's, that's yeah. I'm, yeah. in, I'm in that place now where I'm like, maybe I'll never write another poem again. Like I haven't written a poem since I turned okay. the book in. So, I mean, it always comes back in one form or another, but like so far it hasn't seen. Right. <laughs> And um, you you have a line in this book, I don't remember which poem it is in, where you say, um, the older I get, I think I'm paraphrasing and probably butchering it completely, but the less confident I become because I'm not that self-deceptive anymore or something about self-deception, which is- yeah, Yes, the older I get, oh, let me find it actually. Yeah. I, I feel like I know where it is. You would think I would know my own line. <laughs> but you have so many amazing lines. I think what's also like the stitching of the mono line allows <laughs> to, is to create aphorisms really that stand by themselves. I know it ends like the less confident I feel because like less self-deceiving or something. Oh yeah, yeah, something. Um, but it, oh it yeah, I found me. it. Oh wait, did you find it? Yes, it's um, <laughs> the quality of nothing after this nothing happened. Should I read it? Oh yeah, please do. I forgot. I, I, I like to read from my like advanced reading copy. Just oh, I have that version too, right? Now. Oh, yeah. Okay. Because <laughs> it feels like less. Um, Page 30. Yeah, I've got it now. But it's funny because the. I'll, sh I'll sh see if I can show you this. I don't know if my camera will pick it up. But like all the numbers in the TOC are zero because, you know, they yeah. change before they print the final book. So I tried to look in the TOC and that didn't help me. <laughs> but I've got it now. <laughs> Um, the quality of nothing. After this, nothing happened. Why is there something rather than nothing feels disingenuous on an ontological level because we think of even nothing as something. I think of nothing as empty space in all directions. But emptiness, darkness, is something. It feels like we need some light to see the darkness. We'd need some time to see the space. Nothing happened before this because no thing happens in no time. It feels like if space were transparent, we'd have to see something through it on the other side. But nothing has no sides. The question is, why is there something or nothing? Why that nothing instead of some other under nothing? Which is more frightening, nothing or empty space? What's the difference between scared and afraid? Is it the difference between a present threat and a future threat? Or a sudden threat and a slow one? Are there horror stories where the people in the story aren't scared? Or is all horror fear horror? What's scary is the fear. If we like scary movies, we must like real horror on some level too. I like listening to sad music when I'm sad. It doesn't make me feel happier per se, it just improves the quality of the sadness. More to the point, certain frivolities that used to feel harmless now feel harmful. Choices always feel personal. Personally, 
I like when decisions feel like they make themselves. I like to make small decisions that essentially don't matter. Eye pain feels inherently emotional. The way odd numbers feel more random. As I get older, I feel less confident because less self-deceiving. I sometimes have the feeling that everything in the future is inevitable, yet I have to experience the events as if they weren't. Or the present is the illusion that we don't know the future. Samuel Johnson said, nothing odd will do long. Tristram Shandy did not last. Not will not, did not. Chief Plentiku of the Crow Nation said, when the buffalo went away, the hearts of my people fell to the ground and they could not lift them up again. After this, nothing happened. After this, nothing happened. Like throwing a paper airplane into a canyon. Maybe we don't yet understand everything about how this happened. After the shock comes a feeling that I knew this would happen. Thank you for reading it. I love this poem so much. Um, what I, I, I love the first, like the first half of it feels so philosophical, almost like the Tractatus, like the propositions, right? Um, using all of these big nouns and making assertions about them and kind of highlighting the absurdity of the relationship between them. Um, and, I, on, and then it moves into this apocalyptic anxiety to some extent, right? And um, it's hard not to read the pandemic into this. And you said that you wrote some of the poems um, during the pandemic. I wonder how long it took you to um, complete the collection um, and how you put them all together, like mm -hmm. what the order, what how you decided upon the order, because yeah, yeah um, I'm in the process of ordering again. Yeah, it's, it's always difficult, right? It's like, it's like just enough too many poems to feel like the combinations are infinite. Right. <laughs> they like, they essentially are. <laughs> essentially <laughs> infinite combinations. Um, and it's a really hard problem. And with these, I think it was especially hard because it was over the course of like five years that I wrote these. It's, that's hard for me to believe, but um I know that my last poetry book came out in 2016 and now it's 2022. And I like, I didn't turn this book in until um, like 2021. And I know I started writing the poems like when my last book had just came out. So five years, God goes by so fast. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so, and you know, I kind of talked about how like my method for writing them like evolved over those years as well. So like at first I was just trying to write a book of like that first kind, those long prosy ones. And then I, I just sort of felt like I didn't have any more of that in me. <laughs> like I had lost that sort of, um, it, it was almost like a kind of focus, like to be able to do that like have something new to say about nothingness or time. Um, and I can kind of draw it out philosophically in these propositions. Like I felt like I'd sort of lost the ability to do that. And I, I, I didn't have enough living, <laughs> you know, like it, you need, you need plenty of life to have new ideas. And, right. you know, by like, like late in the Trump years and then moving into the pandemic, I just didn't feel like I was doing enough living. I was like stuck on the internet and I was busy writing another book also and like promoting another book. And um, I just felt like I, I didn't, I didn't have enough input. I was like all output and I was exhausted and my brain was just wrung out like a washcloth. Um, yeah, so then when I looked at all these different poems, part of me wanted to just take this the, like the easy way out. And I'm so glad that people told me not to do this, but I, I tried ordering them like more or less chronologically in the mm -hmm. order that I wrote them. And I felt like, well, there's a narrative arc here. There has to be because they're, you know, they're following like the time in which I wrote them. And so it, it actually ended with all the kind of shorter pandemic poems. Oh, interesting. Yeah. 
and like I I convinced myself like well that works that works but um I had an early reader the poet Brandon Amico read the manuscript kind of early on and he was so great because like not that many people had read the full book and he made me feel and he like fought against my imposter syndrome and he was like this is a great book I love it and he was like the only thing I'm not sure about is the order and I was like shit mm. I was afraid of that um and so I was thinking about that and my editor at South School Sarah Jean Graham Sarah Jean Graham is also a poet she had the same note she was like I just I'm not sure about the order are you married to the order and I was like shit again <laughs> I can't ignore this anymore two people have said they're not sure about the order and I had always had a nagging thought that like maybe the shorter poem should be kind of peppered throughout like little interludes right and and I was really um I was really unsure how to approach it at first or I thought I was unsure and I was like Sarah could you just do it for me <laughs> she was like okay I'll try but then I was like while she was working on it I just I tried it on my own and I ended up getting it in like one try. Oh my God. That's amazing. I know. It was like, I'd taken all the pressure off myself. You know, I was like, it's already in an order. My editor's working on it, but maybe I'll just try. It was like a little game. And then I instantly felt like, no, this is it. I have it. This is the order. That's perfect. I, ha I had to have already given up though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to be able to do it. <laughs> Yeah, once, yeah, if the stakes are too high in your own mind, it usually, yeah, it doesn't work that well. But it seems like you intuitively knew what the order would be. It feels perfect right now. It's so balanced and tight. So, yeah, I was wondering. I so, yeah, I, I feel really happy with how that came out. And can I ask, because I feel like with a first book, there's mm -hmm. often the same problem that the poems have been written over like a longer stretch of time. And it can be really hard to figure out how to make an arc out of that without either doing it chronologically or putting it in like six different sections. <laughs> like, so how did you do it? Okay. I actually asked the question because I was asked the question earlier today at the class visit in Arizona here at the university. And um, I also, I, I never, I, I attended a talk where Carl Phillips said that he orders most of his poetry collections completely chronologically in the order he wrote them. And he usually doesn't have a second reader even uh, before he sends it to his editor, which is yes, insane, yes. but also he is Carl Phillips. I know, um, right? <laughs> <laughs> Carl Phillips can do it. Yeah, yeah, I'm like, he can do that. He can get away with it. <laughs> Probably purposely writes them in the perfect order. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. He's like He has like galaxy brain. It's already ordered <laughs> before he sits down to write them I was in my with my first book it was really difficult but I think I wanted it to have an almost novelistic arc where the speaker moves from childhood to like adulthood in some sense as at least like the poem my book is bracketed by like two sections of lyric poetry and then there is a kind of like fragmentary essayistic piece about translation and Rilke and a long documentary poem in the middle. And um, I really wanted the lyric poems at the beginning and the end to have that kind of arc of like a journey, like a hero's journey almost, like just a, like an, like a Bildungsroman, a childhood speaker growing up um, or a speaker reflecting on their childhood and how they have grown up and moved to different countries and encountered different languages. And then at the same time, I did want to have those longer poems um, in the middle just to show my formal interests because I, why I love lyric poetry, I also love to experiment. I love prose. I love the longer lines and the fragments and um, to plumb a little more um, out of what I can do with language. And then to have those, one of them, one of which is like about my relationship to language, one the, like the longer poem, to have that in the middle felt important because that's never going to go away. And that's at the heart of my life. And at the same time, like that documentary poem that really collapses the boundary between the political and the personal, to have that in the middle also felt felt accurate because um, although I am trying often in my life to not think about these matters, they do affect me in very real ways. So um yeah, I was really thinking about novels more when I was structuring the collection, to be honest. Um, yeah. People told me to read um, the early confessional poets. I think my thesis advisor told me, I don't think I did back then to order my book, so I don't know whether I, 
looked at that. I was I was truly looking at at people's novels as to how to structure them, and I also wrote into this idea of the of characters like the nuclear family. When I saw that there were some mother poems missing or father poems missing, I thought that I had to write them. Now that I'm working on my thing, that feels like it could be a class, like how to structure a poetry book. Like yeah, I th yeah. Oh, I yeah, that would be a great class. Um, or like how to structure a poetry book in general, you know, like how to put a po book of poems together. There are so many different ways. Um, I have some more questions. I don't know if the audience is asking anything right now. Otherwise, I mean, I feel like I haven't even started asking the questions I, written, I wrote down earlier. Um, oops. Let's see. So I have a question here from Lisa. Um, Everyone in the audience, of course, if you have questions, now is the time. We would love to hear from you. Um, but this is from Lisa. Uh, do you get ideas while taking walks? Perhaps feel when you're in motion or in a different setting um, as a way of taking breaks from your desk slash the internet? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't even think it's like the desk, the internet, so much as there's something very special about a walk, right? Because it's like, it's like the lowest possible level of outside stimulation you can get. Because usually you're walking on a route that you've walked before, you know? Like, I don't think it works as well if you're like in a brand new city, you know, you just flew to Zurich for the first time and you're walking around Zurich. That's not the, that's not the time that you're going to have an idea for a poem. It's like, when you're taking the walk that you always take so it's mm -hmm. a route that's super familiar and everything is mostly the same but, but there's something just a little bit different like there's a dead bunny <laughs> on that corner where usually there's not a dead bunny um or the weather's a little different like it's it's just different enough that it like triggers your attention without being so distracting that your mind can't kind of like go into poetry mode because you need to be in this very kind of special state that's I don't know it's like hard to describe if you've never been in it it's just <laughs> you know like <laughs> I, I feel like it's it's not all the way to like sensory deprivation like you can't be completely bored you have to be like a little bit stimulated but not too much you can't be watching tv or something because that's too much stimulation there's too much distraction it's like this little middle zone <laughs> when like suddenly like ideas come um and like your own your own mind becomes kind of like loud to yourself and the, I don't know that just that always happens to me when I'm walking and it also sometimes happens when I'm at poetry readings this is oh my god same I have the same problem I thought I was a psychopath oh my god we're so like yes like when I'm in a poetry reading unless if it's like the most amazing poet in the world I'm wrapped but often it's just like, you know, if there's I five people, one of them is boring, but I'm still there and I've been listening to poetry and suddenly I start thinking of a poem. <laughs> same, the same thing happens to me. Sometimes also while I'm reading, I'm like reading the first paragraph of something or the first couple of lines and immediately right. my mind wanders off. Yeah, and yeah you're not, but you're it's... not really reading. You're just like, exactly. You're, you're just, you're just like staring. <laughs> yeah, it's that, I've never thought of it that way. Like that medium amount of stimulation familiarity but also little estrangement mm -hmm. to some extent yeah mm -hmm. um I also I feel like when I'm in motion generally whether it is whether I'm walking or I'm driving but usually not when I am the driver um when I'm on the passenger seat or something or I'm on a train or on a plane oh, um, trains yes trains planes, yes. 100% come so quickly I don't know what it is exactly but I think maybe it's just the idea of being in motion while also sitting or if you're walking a familiar route it doesn't take and yeah take that much um away from you so that your mind is still active and can access that creative space yeah so much I love that. So this is from Rick. Uh, it says, any plans from either poet for a novel? So you know, or I was working on a novel. Um, I, <laughs> I, am, more? I am working on a novel, which is the bane of my existence, actually. 
I've been trying to write a novel my whole life, but I think I uh, seriously started working on it during the pandemic in the summer of 2020. And um, it's changed many forms. And I feel like the most depressing aspect about it is that I think about audience and I just need to get rid of that voice um, or that anxiety that thinks about the reception um, of, of, yeah, of how it will, how people will read it and what people, yeah, what people will think. Um, but it's also very, it's just very, very hard because poetry is just a single poem. I'm in a nonfiction class right now and I'm supposed to write an essay for next week. And that also feels extremely hard because I like writing reviews where I have an argument probably already formed while I'm reading the book and it's not necessarily about me and I don't have to disclose anything or <laughs> become super vulnerable, but both fiction and nonfiction um, necessitate a type of vulnerability um, that I'm not used to just because it's more extended and sustained than um, poetry which allows for more leaps and play yeah yeah 100 percent um yeah I, I i think the longer the forum the more it feels like it's just getting away from you and you mm -hmm. can't protect it anymore and like you don't have control and like uh, I, I think poets are control freaks often it's 100 percent i am <laughs> um and so yeah it's it's really it's really scary until you're able to sort of let go and I, I like I try to kind of dare myself to um write longer and longer pieces because you have to let go and you have to just let it get messy and out of your hands um but no I even though novels are like my absolute favorite thing to read I have never tried to write a novel who knows maybe someday oh I'm sure it will happen yeah but I'm currently writing an essay about poets novels I can't wait to read it. <laughs> I wanted to ask you, have you read Rilke's novel? Because yes, I have. I just read it earlier this year and it's like my favorite thing in the world. I need to reread it because when I read it as a teenager, which was honestly the last time I read it, uh, I really didn't Did like you it read at it all. In German? Yes, I read it in German. I read Rilke in German most of the time now, even though while I was writing Heart Damage, I um, was convinced that Rilke is better in English, but I've changed my mind. <laughs> I want to talk to you more about that. That might Absolutely. be like yeah, we have to talk about. It might be an offline conversation, but yes. I really want to talk to you about that. Yeah. <laughs> I think there's one more question. I don't know. Yeah, so I have a question here from Carolyn. Um, it says this is related questions for each of you. Um, Elisa, how does your work as an essayist and reviewer influence, affect, or infect your poetry, and then? Aria, how does your work with prose influence your poetry? Yeah. Um, actually, I like that because it it turns the usual question I get on its head. I usually get like, how does your work as a poet influence your nonfiction? Um, but I mean, I think you can see in this book how my nonfiction has started to influence my poetry because like my first book is just like capital P poems, you know, they're like poem poems with, <laughs> with lines. It's not, it's not prosy. I don't think it's essayistic at all. It's very like, um, like a classic lyrical collection. And yeah, my, I think my poetry has gotten prosier um, as I've gone deeper into my poetic career. Um, and I think it, it's just maybe getting harder for me to switch lanes. And so I just, ride down the middle of the road <laughs> with half the car in one lane and half in the other um yeah <laughs> what's your answer I I agree actually I feel like because I've I haven't really worked heavily on prose until the last two years. So after my book was already out, um, it will probably show in my newer work. And as I said, I'm also, I also have this weird tendency towards the very long line in the sentence, like just a thinking sentence to write that instead of like a, an enjambed line. Um, so definitely in the, in the way I construct sentences, I think it's affected it. And in the way I draft too, I often draft on my iPhone notes. I'm really notoriously bad at keeping, a, keeping an actual journal. Um, and it's easier when you're like on a walk or on a train or something to, to write in your iPhone notes. And instead of um, 
just noting down um, or documenting little fragments of thought or images, I tend towards um, writing down a little observation that is already a fully formed sentence or a paragraph or something, which feels like um, just a, a, an exercise in thinking. And it reminds me of something that I don't know where you said this. I think it's in one of your essay collections, um, your other essay collection. You have two, right? Yeah. Yeah. The word yeah. Pretty. The word pretty. I think it's in the word pretty where you say that, um, where you talk about your uh, when you're a child that you talk to your mother about a voice narrating every action back to you. And I definitely also had that for the majority of my life. And it kind of went away when I was in my early 20s, which is when I became a poet. <laughs> but until then, I felt like and until then, I felt like very much like a fiction writer or a prose writer. And, and I think it's just it depends on the way you're thinking. And the more I'm trying to write prose, the more that narrating voice comes back rather than thinking in shapes or colors or impressions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I have like a million more questions, but I don't know if I should start <laughs> them by asking them now. How about how we have a couple more minutes. So audience members, if you have any last questions, now is the time to throw them in the Q&A. And Aria, if you have like a great question, maybe ask it and let them take a second. <laughs> no pressure. No worries. I was wondering if you could... Okay, I have questions. I'm not going to preface them like with, with wild anecdotes because we don't have that much time. But um, if you could talk either about um, boredom or humor, both as like concepts in life and uh, merits in literature, because you mentioned both of them in, in your book, Normal Distance, and you enact both also. Um, yeah, I would love to chat a little about humor just because... Yes. Um, yeah, not not as many people recently have asked me about that, and it's important to me. Like, and I, I don't want to, I don't want to sound negative, but I feel like we're in a period where, like, it's not it's not the thing as much for poems to be funny. Yeah, <laughs> um, and I'm not sure why, except for you know. The maelstrom of the zeitgeist as has been discussed like it just happens and we don't have a lot of control over it and you know it's like we've been through a dark past five years um and it can be really hard not to like let that mood or overtake you when you're writing but like i just one of the things i want from poetry when i'm you know reading it not writing it but reading it is like I want to laugh like I feel like mm -hmm. poetry is it, it can be such a fun and playful form and I don't feel like I see enough funny poetry in the new the new books that I get in my in my mailbox all the time and when I do find a funny collection I'm super drawn to it and I, I think that there's like a little bit of a misconception that like, well, if, if you want to be taken seriously or, you know, if you want to, um, like, en engage with political material, um, that you can't be funny. But, mm -hmm. like, I, I totally disagree. Like, I think there's, like, no binary. I don't think they're in opposition at all. Like, when I think of, you know, like, June Jordan, super political, but hilarious. Mm -hmm. um, or, like, Terrence Hayes. Yeah. Hilarious. Like, I just... I feel like it's a false binary and <laughs> we need to tear the walls down because just the poetry that I love most like makes me like happy and sad and I'm laughing and depressed all at the same time <laughs> um and yeah I don't know I just I, I really appreciate it when people have told me like um this poem feel this book feels serious but also funny like that's absolutely and it's like it's not it's not like side clapper like you know I'm not like <laughs> <laughs> it's not like oh, oh, oh my god but it's like it's so I think but I feel like all I, I feel like Wittgenstein can be really funny um also mm -hmm. you know it's like when you're deep 
deeply deadly serious, there is just something absurd that emerges out of those observations or the, the reality that we're in. It is very funny, like being alive on earth as a human actually. And I think, <laughs> you know, it's like, it's pretty hilarious actually. And really- and like poetry it's itself, like the act of writing a poem can like, can feel so like absurd and silly sometimes. I know. <laughs> And I, I also am so so much more like drawn towards poetry that allows humor mm -hmm. or sarcasm or kind of like just like a wittiness into yeah. into its voice. Um, it feels more genuine somehow. I mean, I also love the super depressing poems, obviously. But <laughs> wait, oh god! Wait, but do we have a minute? Can you read a poem of yours? I really wanted to make time for that. Can we do that before we yeah. end? We have, we, we got the permission, I guess. I'll try and find yeah, one. Please do, please do. <laughs> okay, I'm going to, I'm going to read um, a very short one, uh, one of my new poems, which um, actually has line breaks on it, so, but also very long. <laughs> April, I want to die. I want to die because the magnolias are opening again and I can't stop thinking about this man from up north, which means I am losing control over my life. When he talks, the world of ideas burgeons ferociously. Like sea anemones, I write in my phone. I haven't had an original thought in weeks. My therapist says, congratulations on the new romance but there are rituals I keep secret from her. 20 grapes in a mason jar, the ridges of the sidewalk I am not allowed to step on. I stop eating because I can. Walking to my lover's house, all the red cars and camellias shout, this is ecstasy, ecstasy. Even the lamps this evening grow eyes that ridicule me. He only says the right things and has strands of my hair in his mouth when he comes. Um, that's it. Yay! I'm so <laughs> glad you read that particular poem because it feels like it speaks to so many things that we were talking about. Yeah. Like, um, just like, I like how the poet is present in the poem as like a presence who knows they're a poet you know yeah. <laughs> and that just amplifies the pose the pose of the poet and the eye and um and the kind of like sick of myself being a poet already yeah. feels in there um I love that and I really I love when your poems like quote other poets I'm a big fan of that uh, you do that too. I noticed, I feel like especially with whenever my new collection is ready, it will definitely be in conversation with normal distance. I'm seeing a lot of like similar obsessions. Yeah. Well, I'm so thrilled we were able to do this. Thank you so much, Aria. You're wonderful. Thank you for having me and inviting me to do this. And um, yeah, I'm excited to continue the conversation offline at some point. <laughs> I know, we're going to talk about Rukka. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, this has been wonderful. I hate to stop the, the, the party, but unfortunately, we have <laughs> come to the end of our night. Um, for those of you in the audience, thank you so much for joining us. If you would like to get your hands on copies of Normal Distance or Hard Damage, I'm going to go ahead and relink them. Voila. Um, so as always, let us know what you thought of this event, either in person or on any of the social media. We love to hear from you. Um, Alisa and Aria, huge thank you for being here. Thank this was you. such thank a so wonderful conversation. Um, I am sad that I will not get to hear the rest of the real conversation, <laughs> but we'll hold it together. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Is there anything else you'd like to say before we wave goodbye? Just thank you to everyone who came. I'm, I see the little comments in the chat and <laughs> just thank you for listening and coming. Um, yeah. And thank you, Ali. Thank you. Art. Just, it was great. It was thank fun. you. <laughs> <laughs> All thank right. you so much. This was fun. Bye. Good night, Bye, everyone. everyone. <laughs>